Hello, I'm Jake Stone. I'm Jesse Owens. And we welcome you to another episode of Generally Particular, a production of the London Lyceum. Generally Particular is a show dedicated to discussing and reflecting on the whole Baptist story. We are a show by Baptists, about Baptists, and for Baptists, as well as Anglicans, Methodists, Presbyterians, and Lutherans. I'm a Calvinist Baptist, and Jesse is an Arminian Baptist. In the 17th and 18th centuries, we would have been known as a particular Baptist and a general Baptist. And so we brought those two together for what we think is a fun show, hence generally particular. Today in Louisville, it has been a great Baptist day. First of all, we had our Kiffin Room meeting, and we talked about the gospel worthy of all acceptation, part two. And then today at work, I was blessed by somebody looking to do research into Morgan Edwards, the great Baptist of the 18th century, who was also kind of one of those forerunners of being a Baptist historian on the American side. So it's been a great day. It's 60 degrees. It's warmed up today. Not for long. It'll be wind chills below 20 tonight. So we take what we can get. Jesse has been uh, kind of startled before we got started. He was knocking his water off, his coffee over, and he had balloons coming up <laughs> off of the screen. And so he's just in a celebratory mood. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure exactly what it's all in that coffee he's been drinking today, but he is excited to be on here. As well. I'm glad to be here, like like always. So today, as we're continuing our Baptist Bio series, Remember that we kind of left off back in merry old England with John Gill, and today we're looking at the Salters Hall controversy, also known as Jesse's Pet Project, because it is what he did his dissertation on at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Now, let me go ahead and frame this for our audience. If any of you are familiar, and you are because we've had him on twice, you know that Garrett Walden's mission in life is to give a revised version of John <laughs> Ryland Sr. Oh, and William man. Carey and all of those things. Well, I know Garrett this is, is a going. particular Baptist version of Jesse, because Jesse is the general Baptist version of that, but with the Salters Hall controversy. Those who oppose the Trinity, Jesse says they were just misunderstood. So he's going to try to defend the heretics today on our show. So, Jesse, tell us about <laughs> Salters Hall. First yeah. of all, where is Salters Hall? Yeah, Salters Hall was a meeting house in London, and uh, it's where a series of meetings occurred in the early part of 1719. And it was dealing with some concerns about um, some ministers in Exeter and um, an appeal that had been sent to them. Uh, and a committee had been formed to consider what ought to be done about these ministers in Exeter when their parishioners and some others were concerned that they did not affirm the doctrine of the Trinity. So the meeting at Salters Hall, at the meeting house at Salters Hall, was focused on dealing with this controversy in Exeter, but it ended up becoming a controversy of its own. So it's, it's a meeting convened to solve a controversy but it becomes a controversy uh, in its own right. Um, there are a series of meetings at, at Salters Hall in early 1719. There are Congregationalists, Presbyterians, uh, General Baptists, and Particular Baptists. I want to say that um, W.T. Whitley says something like, it's surprising that the Baptists were involved or requested to be involved in the first place. I, I don't know that that's uh, entirely accurate, but uh, here you have in the early 18th century uh, this gathering of dissenting ministers from um, from Congregationalist churches, from Presbyterian churches, and from general and particular Baptist churches, and they're trying to decide how they should advise uh, these congregations to deal with these ministers in Exeter, and it turns out that they have a disagreement amongst themselves on how to deal with the issue, and that leads to uh, the Salters Hall controversy. Now, is this W.T. Whitley reference, is that from his a History of British Baptist? I'm trying to remember where he says that, where he says, uh, you know, Whitley wrote so much. Uh, Whitley uh, wrote in the early 20th century, um, and uh, he, he wrote so much. I, I don't really remember off the top of my head where he says that. 
that's a good because see what what we what we believe about how we do history is ultimately kind of like that conspiracy theory guy the me you know the gif the meme where he's kind of connecting all the dots because what i want our audience to see is already jesse is citing wt whitley and here on the forward in this book here is about the angus lectureship and i just want our audience to kind of hear where we're going jesse's defending these people and here in the the angus lectureship one of them that is printed is 1906 john clifford mm. and the title of that lecture is this you ready jesse quote the ultimate problems of christianity folks what else do i need to say about <laughs> these people yeah. Yeah. and for the record also jesse likes to talk about me as big eva he will use that on me he, he loves to tag me on that but we're actually using jesse's chapter from trinity creed and confusion the Salters Hall Debates of 1719, beautiful volume here from the Center for Baptist Studies and Oxford Publications. Also in this book are chapters from Dr. Stephen Holmes and Dr. Malcolm Yarnell. So I, I don't have anything like this. So I think Jesse's really the more of the big evil version <laughs> than I am. So yeah, yeah, that's that's me. I, I made yes. it in this volume and I'm I'm big even. No, they had a conference on the Salters Hall controversy in 2000 and uh, 19, I guess it was. And so I went to that uh, conference at Regents Park College uh, at Oxford and uh, got to talking with Paul Fittis. And uh, he asked me if I'd be willing to write a chapter. And he didn't know me from Adam. So I really, uh, <laughs> it was it was kind of a providential thing. So that's how I ended up with this chapter in here on the General Baptist at Salter's Hall. Notice, notice, ladies and gentlemen, how he just smoothly inserts in there, you know, he's been to the UK and He's been to all the holy sites. That was my you know, that was my only me. I've I've never been there. So yeah. That was my only time. And I didn't get to go into the Angus because uh it wasn't open at that time. But um yeah, it was a good trip. We're gonna have you know a, why? Because you don't you don't have the Baptist credentials like I do. That's why they didn't let you in. So. That that's right. That's right. Hey, um we're we're still, I'm telling you, at some point in the next few years, we're gonna have a generally particular slash London Lyceum. English uh, descent Baptist history tour. It's going to be be led by Jake Stone and Garrett Walden, and I don't know. We'll see. Somebody better be donating some big bucks for that to happen, <laughs> because it ain't coming out of my pocket. <laughs> wow. wow! I don't know if I could even afford the plane ticket to get over, let alone come back. So. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, so yeah. So the question here, let me just sort of frame this. So the question I think at Salters Hall is um, you have someone recommends that basically a document be sent to Exeter uh, in a, a letter of advices recommending subscription to a Trinitarian statement um, drawn from the 39 articles. Um, and, uh, and so there's a disagreement about about that but there's also put forward this idea that the ministers present at salters hall there in london convened to deal with this issue um whether or not they are in favor of including uh this recommendation uh to subscribe to the doctrine of the trinity and what you end up having is a division between what's called subscribers and non-subscribers and it has to do with whether or not they're in favor of recommending subscription to the ministers uh, there at Exeter who seem to be opposed to the doctrine of the Trinity. But when you have this opposition to subscription, uh, the question then becomes, okay, those who favor subscription would seem to be Trinitarian, and those who oppose subscription uh, might seem to be anti-Trinitarian. So can we just simply say subscriptionists were Trinitarian and non-subscriptionists were anti-Trinitarian? And, you know, very few people, I think, would say that simply yes, then that's that's the easy or the right way of interpreting this. But you do get the sense quite often in, in a lot of history books that deal with this, uh, that this event, the Salters Hall controversy, is just indicative of the theological decline of the English Presbyterians and the English General Baptists. And you can just point to it and say, we'll see that the majority of them were non-subscribers at Salters Hall. Um, at the end of the day, I do think that this is problematic, but the, the, the way of categorizing it as sort of just having two sides, 
subscribing equals Trinitarian, non-subscribing equals anti-Trinitarian is, um, I, I don't think is, is helpful, especially when you begin assessing the ministers who are subscribers and non-subscribers. And there are over, there end up being over a hundred and I want to say close to 150 uh, names listed, even though in the initial vote, there's something like 110 uh, names uh, or people involved in the vote. So, so what I'm trying to do is to say we need a, a third category. We need something other than just subscriber equals Trinitarian Orthodoxy, non-subscriber equals uh, Trinitarian or non-Trinitarian or anti-Trinitarian uh, heterodoxy. And uh, so I'm trying to introduce this idea of a, of a third category of a middle sort uh, to explain that there are actually Orthodox uh, Trinitarian non-subscribers at Salters Hall. And uh, maybe you want to ask a question here, Jake. Um, I will say before you before you say anything uh, or ask any questions, um, I don't think it's hard for us, if for our listeners, if you grew up in a in a Baptist church, I don't think it's hard for some of us to imagine the idea that there might be people who are orthodox in doctrine, but who would say, you know, I, I'm not sure I want to require people to sign a man-made confession of faith or a confession of faith that uses these big fancy theological words or extra biblical words and phrases so that you might be opposed to what you see as a certain imposition of subscription, whether that's right or wrong. And I think ultimately it ends up being wrong, um, but still be orthodox in doctrine, but opposed to this additional requirement of subscription to a uh, confession of faith. So we could say that your project is an attempt for a third way. Third way of you sounds very moderate and it's kind of squishy to me. So. <laughs> yeah, my uh, well, this is so I, I would say as a historical endeavor, my my goal is to provide a what I think is a more accurate interpretation of the events. So what I would say generally is true in history and in historical research and writing, and it's true of this event, is it's never quite as simple as it seems. You can't, you, rarely can you just sort of put people in one of two categories and everyone just kind of fit. They're yeah, all, but that's easier. That I is like easier. That. that is a lot easier. It's a lot, uh, it's a lot less complex. Um, but it doesn't always do justice to the actual facts. And, um, and I, I think this is borne out uh, across the board among the subscribers and non-subscribers in the Salters Hall controversy. But I think it's true of the general Baptists there uh, at, in the controversy as well. Um, and, and I think I was just going to say to kind of give the lay of the land, um, the majority and, and it's not. Um, the, the majority, a, kind of a, a simple majority among the Congregationalists, a, a good majority, though, um, are, are subscribers at Salters Hall. The majority, the overwhelming majority of particular Baptists are subscribers at, Hall, at Salters Hall. And the majority of general Baptists, except for one person, uh, I think there are uh, 13 total, uh, is a, are non-subscribers at Salters Hall. There's only one general Baptist subscriber. And the majority, not all, but the majority of English Presbyterians, there are also some Scottish Presbyterians present, are um, non-subscribers at Salter's Hall. So the majority of Congregationalists, the majority of particular Baptists were subscribers or in favor of su subscription. And um, the General Baptists, the majority of them, and the Presbyterians were non-subscribers. So the kind of normal historical narrative here then is, like I said earlier, is to just look at this and say, well, then you can see that in 1719, the, the, the General Baptists in and around London and the, uh, the Presbyterians in and around London already seem to have embraced anti-Trinitarianism or at least open to anti-Trinitarianism maybe is not being problematic. And I don't think that is actually where the data leads us. That's, that's an over, um, oversimplified interpretation. All right, go ahead. No, what I was going to say is kind of what I found fascinating. You, you just talked about how history is, is really complex and how we do history requires us to wrestle with the complexities. There's mm -hmm. layers in a sense. Yeah. 
And it made me think about that. I finally, I think, have, have discovered the, the, the picture, the analogy to justify how I drink coffee. Because my coffee has layers and it's complex. It, it has the coffee, the cream, and the sugar. You see, it so it's it's not just simple. Yeah, it's one liquid. See, yeah. There you, <laughs> so, hey, folks, there's a coffee shop here, and I can't remember which one. I saw the advertisement. They've got their one of their spring brews is strawberry Sunday, and I was like, this is I've got to go try that. That sounds like my kind of coffee. You were thinking, hey, whenever Jesse's in town next, that's where we're going to go. Yeah, it would be great. Yeah, sounds like my cup, my cup of coffee right there. Yeah, a lot of a lot of cream, chocolate, and then strawberry. Yes. Yeah. And so, coffee. all right. So, do you want me to make my case for why I think that uh, that some of the majority of the non-subscribers at Salter's Hall were not anti-Trinitarian. So let, let me make, let me make, make. Well, before you do that, let me just say this real quick to our audience. The reason we're trying to, we're looking at this is that the simplistic way that things get framed. So if we're talking about Baptist in England in the 18th century, usually this is how the narrative goes. All the particular Baptists became hyper-Calvinist. And all the general Baptists became Unitarians. That's usually kind of how the story gets told. And so we're trying to say that's, that's, that's not fair. For example, you point this out in your chapter, is that we're dealing with general Baptist representatives here in London. So it's a very specific group of people. And sometimes, yeah. you know, Jesse makes the point that you, you take one s- slice of a denomination's life and you re you interpret everybody through that lens. The same thing happens with particular Baptists in England because of men like John Brine and John Skeff and then, you know, Gill the debate or whatever, you know, that everybody is, is like that in particular Baptist life. And while there's a, there are, you know, those in London and elsewhere, you have the Western association where the Evanses are, and there's much of an evangelical Calvinism. Much of what you would find in, later in Fuller is there in the earlier part of the 18th century. And so we're trying to say that, you know, it's, it's easy that these kinds of lines are easy to say, but we all know that you just can't paint people in broad strokes. I mean, even now, you know, we don't like we, we don't like to get lumped in in a group that way. And so I don't think we should do that when we're talking about history. So that's yeah. one of the reasons we're kind of looking at this. Yeah, I think you're right. That That is the standard narrative of kind of general and particular Baptists in the 18th century. One goes into theological decline on the doctrine of the Trinity, and the other just becomes entirely uh, overtaken by hyper-Calvinism, is, gives up on any sort of evangelism. Um, and so, so they just kind of diverge uh, in this way. So, yeah, I think that's right. And here, uh, and here is our reaction to that kind of history. That's why we look like this. When we have that kind of simplistic history done, this is why John Gill looks mad. All right. So we don't want to do that kind of history. Yeah. No, that, no, that's, we don't want to see Jesse make that face today. We don't. That's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. Um, so when I began looking into this controversy, um, I don't know, uh, four years ago, five years ago, it took me a long time to just even wrap my mind around what all was happening. There are very few kind of just uh, historical reconstructions of the events and the order in which they occurred and who the key players are and some of the key works that are written are. So it took me a long time to kind of wrap my mind around it. And then to kind of look at these lists of all of these ministers from various denominations uh, and and some of them interacting with one another in places outside of this um, controversy, sometimes in friendly ways, sometimes working together. In fact, in this chapter, I give an example, uh, a couple of examples, uh, one through a relationship with Benjamin Stinton, uh, the particular Baptist Benjamin Stinton. Um, for our listeners, uh, Benjamin Stinton was kind of instrumental 
in putting together the Hanover Coffee House meetings, which included General Baptists and Particular Baptists uh, in 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 London. And so um, Stinton includes included in these meetings are figures who are involved in the Salters Hall controversy and sometimes on different sides, some of them subscribers, some of them non-subscribers. Uh, Benjamin Stinton actually died, I think it's eight days prior to the first meeting at Salters Hall. And as a kind of unifying figure among general and particular Baptists, I wonder if he would have had maybe some influence among them. Uh, maybe things might have been slightly different. But nonetheless, through Stinton's influence through the Hanover Coffee House meetings and those sorts of things, we see some crossover between some of the subscribers and non-subscribers among the general and particular Baptists at Salters Hall. Um, Stinton was also well known for wanting to make it possible for General Baptist to be included in what became the particular Baptist fund. And he actually gives a list of something like seven reasons of why uh, General Baptist should be included in the particular Baptist fund. Uh, that might be something you want to talk about, Jake, or something we can talk about at, at a later date. But but it's it's an interesting point. There are also some accounts of some of these same uh, Baptists, General Baptist and particular Baptist, outside of the Salters Hall controversy, sharing a same meeting house and actually working together to repair a baptistry in uh, that meeting house that they shared. So here are these figures that fall on opposite sides of the controversy at Salters Hall, who are supposedly non-subscribers and subscribers. And if we were to, to just sort of pigeonhole them as uh, Trinitarian or anti-Trinitarian, but yet they're working together outside of here uh, to, to repair a baptistry in a, in a building that they're sharing. Um, all of these things lead me to the conclusion, and there's there's much more that that I, I want to say, but, e but even this kind of leads me to the conclusion that it can't be so simple as uh, the subscribers were Trinitarian and the non-subscribers were anti-Trinitarian. There's just too much friendly collegiality and overlap and working together for that to be the case. You also have instances of ministers and assistants in the same congregation with one being a subscriber and one being a non-subscriber within the same church, within the same congregation. And then um, Edward um, Wallen, uh, who was pastor of the church at uh, uh, Mays Pond. Um, and I, I think this is something we talked about in a previous um, uh, episode. Doesn't the, Jake, the Mays Pond congregation comes out of Keech's congregation uh, there's a split. So Edward Wallen is is pastoring. Yeah, they're the, they're the, the ones opposed to him singing. Okay. So so Edward Wallen's congregation comes out of the Maze Pond congregation. They were opposed to him singing. Wallen is a is a subscriber at Salters Hall. So he's in favor of requiring subscription uh, at Salters Hall. I want to read to you. This is a little bit longer, but he's a subscriber. He's there. And this is how he interprets the events. Again, this leads me to think that maybe there are some anti-Trinitarians at Salters Hall, but not to the conclusion that all of the non-subscribers or even the majority of the non-subscribers were anti-Trinitarians. And this comes from a, an actual subscriber who's there. So this is what uh, Wallen says. Some of the two warm among the non-subscribers would fain fix the odious charge of persecution on the other, while they again, with full as much warmth, would fix the charge of Arianism upon them. But this severity is not allowed by the greatest part of either side of the question, and I hope time will produce a better temper in both parties, as I am satisfied that some among the non-subscribers are gone too far into some of the distinctive notions of Arius. So I think some of the subscribers have, gone, have given too much ground to jealousy, they intended to set up those forms as a test of orthodoxy, and the signing of them is necessary to persons being useful in ministry. But I dare say, for the much greater part of both sides, that they intended no evil to their differing brethren, and that it was their zeal for the doctrine of the Trinity and the real divinity of our Savior, which made some subscribe the articles, and not any desire to impose upon others, and that those who refuse subscription did it with a design to maintain Christian liberty rather than any design to encourage or promote Arianism. 
There is no great difference in the number of either side. But I think there are not so many of our denomination, he's talking about Calvinist Baptists, among the non-subscribers as are on the other side. And though I cannot say that there are none of our ministers who too much favor the new scheme, yet I, he's talking about uh, Samuel Clark's new scheme, but anyways, yet I may uh, venture to say in general that our ministers, especially those of the particular um, Baptist denomination are sound in the faith as to the real divinity of Christ and the true doctrine of the blessed Trinity. Therefore, those who upbraid you with their being contrary act either from prejudice or misinformation, but such have been the visible consequences of this difference, that brotherly love and charity, that indispensable ornament of the Christian religion have been greatly lost in these debates. So here you have Edward Wallen saying, you know, maybe there are some anti-Trinitarians among the non-subscribers, but I think the majority of them are orthodox on the doctrine of the Trinity. And the majority of the subscribers weren't trying to unnecessarily impose upon the non-subscribers, but simply trying to defend and affirm the doctrine of the Trinity. So Wallen's interpretation is that um, temperatures got too hot, you know, among people within this controversy, and it created this division that led to accusations that weren't necessarily true. So that's that's Edward Wallen's uh, interpretation of what occurred at Salters Hall, with him being uh, one of the particular Baptist uh, non or particular Baptist subscribers uh, at Salters Hall. Um, I think when you pair that with some other evidence um, among the general Baptists, which I can talk about here in just a moment, it does lead us to the conclusion that that a good number. And I would say the overwhelming majority of the non-subscribers were orthodox on the doctrine of the Trinity, although there were some anti-Trinitarians among them. So one of the things that was interesting to me in reading your, your chapter here is you talk about that there is in 1703 the brief confession which is a revision. Is that a revision of the 1660 confession or is it two separate confessions? Yeah, it, it is a, it is a revision of the, of the standard or brief confession. Uh, it becomes known as the standard confession uh, in some secondary literature, uh, but in its publication, it's actually a brief confession. So this is a revision of that. And it includes uh, some other material um, uh, just for our listeners in the late 1690s among the General Baptist. They continued to meet as a general assembly um, even after, I guess, even after the, uh, the um, particular Baptist maybe ceased meeting. Uh, they continued to meet, but there was concern uh, in the 1770s, but certainly in the 80s and 90s about the teachings of Matthew Caffin. And um, and whether or not he held heterodox views on the doctrine of the Trinity. So Matthew Caffin, uh, there were certain views uh, that were attributed to him, and he was accused to the General Assembly on multiple occasions of holding heterodox views. And the Assembly condemned those views on multiple occasions, but they did not condemn Matthew Caffin as holding those views. In the 1690s, uh, in order to try to kind of close some of those loopholes, potential loopholes within the standard confession, um, uh, Thomas Grantham edited the confession to maybe tighten it up in, in some areas. Uh, but, but Caffin ends up subscribing to that confession as well. Well, by the, the late 1690s, there's a group that actually separates from the General Assembly of General Baptists and forms the General Association of General Baptists. And the General Association of General Baptist <clears throat> seems much more open to using uh, creedal language in order to defend the doctrine of the Trinity. In my chapter, I, and you know, in my, well, let me just say it straight, straightforwardly. In my chapter, I say that there there seem to be these two sort of streams of thought among the General Baptists. There are those who believe in and want to defend the doctrine of the Trinity. But they want to do prime do so primarily by using biblical words and phrases. So you see this in the standard confession. 
uh, Thomas Grantham himself uh, used the word Trinity, and he reprints the Nicene Creed in his work, Christianismus Primitivus. But he seems a little bit hesitant uh, to require subscription or to include uh, an overabundance of extra biblical words and phrases uh, in their confessional statement. Among a certain group of General Baptists, like uh, Thomas Monk and some of the Midlands General Baptists, who were involved in the development of an Orthodox creed, there seems to be a much greater willingness to use technical uh, creedal language in order to defend uh, and, and clarify their defense of the doctrine of the Trinity. And I think you see these two approaches borne out uh, in the General Assembly and in the General Association. The General Assembly trying to use more biblical words and phrases. The, the people who join the, the General Assembly dissatisfied with what they see in the General Assembly, forming the General Association, and wanting to use maybe stricter language to defend the doctrine of the Trinity. So there is a revised version, um, I think, of the Brief Confession. And then they also include some other material uh, in there to um, to defend the doctrine of the Trinity. In uh, 1703 and 1704, as there's some discussion about the General Assembly and the General Association uh, reuniting into a single group. So one of the things that kind of puzzled me a little bit, and of course I'm going to have to, I, I'm asking you to speculate a little bit. One of the men that you talk about in this chapter is Joseph Jenkins. And you, you mentioned here that Jenkins was a part of the, the General Association. So obviously he would be concerned about Matthew Caffin and that, that you know, the heterodoxy there. That he signed the brief confession of 1803 that, that strengthened the language on the, the Trinity and on those doctrines. But yet he doesn't subscribe at Salter's Hall. So the question that I would ask is why would he be willing to sign one confession but not sign another? And mm -hmm. we've almost had there's almost 20 years has passed. Do you think something changed in him? Yeah. As far as his view on subscription or or is there another explanation you feel? Yeah. You think? I think this is one of the difficult things about interpreting this event is um, sometimes you have guys who published a lot of stuff and they might've published things right around the Salters Hall controversy, maybe just before, just after. And that gives us a little bit more insight into what it is that they believed. Um, on Joseph Jenkins in particular, it, yeah, it's difficult to know. I, I would, my guess is that his views on subscription in this particular instance, uh, are, are different or they've changed. This is one of the maybe more complicated things about the Salters Hall controversy is we're not dealing with subscription within the context of a given denomination. We're dealing with a requirement or, or a request for subscription uh, in a kind of interdenominational setting. So I, I think it's possible that people might have been in favor of subscription within their own denomination or within their own group, but might have been a hesitant or somewhat opposed to requiring or, or enforcing subscription uh, on a confession of faith or a statement of faith uh, in an interdenominational setting. I think that's part of it. And you see a little bit of that in the back and forth in the published works of this time is it's kind of like, hey, we've just kind of gained our freedom as dissenters within the English context. Why are we trying to reimpose <laughs> subscription upon ourselves uh, at this point? So I... Um, I think that that might be that might be part of it is the interdenominational setting uh, could be part of it. I do mention in the chapter though uh, that Jenkins uh, does republish even later in that decade in 1707 uh, the work of a General Baptist by the name of John Griffith, and John Griffith is involved in a controversy earlier in the in the 17th century on the laying on of hands. He's he's a really big player in this, this uh, debate among the English General Baptists. And Jenkins republishes his work, and there's very orthodox statements on the doctrine of the Trinity. So what occurs over that kind of decade between then, 
I don't know what the answer is, but I don't think we see anything in Jenkins that would make me think uh, that he holds heterodox views on the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, but for historical purposes, I do think this is one of the difficulties because you almost need a letter or a publication just before, or just after, in order to determine maybe where an individual stands kind of at that specific snapshot in history. And you just, you just don't always have it. One of the other things that I found kind of somewhat perplexing to me is that in formulating this, this type of creed here at this meeting, that they turn to the 39 articles. And all of these are dissenters who would be very familiar with either the Westminster Confession, the Savoy, or the Second London. So do you have any insights on why they would have chosen? Let me rephrase it. Do you think the attempt to use the 39 articles, because you just touched on this a moment ago, is more of a political play? Are you referring to at the Salters Hall controversy or among? Yes. Yeah. So at um, at the Salters Hall controversy, they actually they do use uh, the thirty nine articles and Westminster. Um, so they include um, a portion of the thirty nine articles, and I think from uh, the question and answer to. Oh, is it questions five and six in the Westminster Shorter Catechism? I'm having a hard time remembering off the top of my head. So they do use. Yes. Yeah. You said the fifth and sixth answer. Yeah. yeah so they do use, um, they use the 39 articles and, and Westminster at Salters Hall. That That's kind of the basis for uh, their requirement for subscription. Yeah. So it, it includes both of those. Um, but yeah. Um, is your question though that why didn't they use something else or could they have used? Well, I guess else? what I'm saying is, do you you know you're talking about that this is coming at a time when the centers are trying have gained some freedom politically. Yeah. yeah. Do you think the inclusion? Because I just think it's fascinating that you know they would appeal to the Anglican Confession yeah. in this sense. So part of what they're trying to do is you know there's a there's a historical component here as well, kind of a cultural component here as well. And that is within the last decade, there they had gained greater political freedom. And um, there's some concern that if um, if if there's a conclusion in Parliament that they uh, that some of the dissenting ministers do not affirm the doctrine of the Trinity, that the result might be the loss of some of their religious and political freedom. Um, so part of the desire, I think, is to maintain that freedom and maybe an, an affirmation of, uh, of some of the 39 articles uh, is a way of saying, no, look, we're orthodox on the doctrine of the Trinity. You can see that in, in, subscription, in our subscription to the articles. So I think that's part of it as well. Um, there, there is a political component here. And I think it may be, again, a, in part, a demonstration of their orthodoxy which would include subscription to the articles. Kind of our last question to, to wrap this up. You, may, you make a statement at the end of this chapter. You said, what we find at Salters Hall is that many general Baptists, particularly those in, in and around London, were opposed to confessional subscription. Such opposition rendered them unable to stem the rising tide of heterodoxy in the 18th century as they had no adequate mechanism for maintaining theological orthodoxy in their ranks. Hmm. Do you think the lesson from Salter's Hall, or maybe a lesson or the main lesson, but do you think it is that they were naive hmm. in thinking that somehow not desiring subscription, that in doing so for you know, these principles, let's say, of not wanting to make people sign something. Do you think that was naive in many ways? Yeah, I, I, I do think it's naive. Um, you know, it's interesting if you think about the tradition of traditions of the people gathered there, of the Congregationalists and of the Presbyterians and thinking about the Westminster Confession of Faith and the, the shorter and longer catechisms. 
Uh, no one has a more detailed confession of faith than the English Presbyterians. Um, now, there are some questions about whether or not the English Presbyterians were even requiring subscription at this point in the early 18th century of their ministers, and I think many of them were not. Um, I say that to say, I don't know that subscription is always an absolute foolproof safeguard of orthodoxy. So within the Church of England in the 18th century, and even at the end of the, the 17th century, there's already some concern about what some people would refer to as Aryan subscription, that people, like we, we've talked about this before, <laughs> might hold heterodox views on the doctrine of the Trinity, but still sign uh, the 39 articles, or still might sign uh, a confession of faith, still might subscribe. So subscription is no foolproof uh, defense for the encroachment of heterodoxy. But I do think for the English General Baptist, and I think for the English Presbyterians, uh, the kind of downplaying of the role of subscription left them with almost no mechanism for uh, defending and maintaining theological orthodoxy. So is, is subscriptionism a foolproof defense for the rise of heterodoxy? No. But is the rejection of subscription or the downplaying of subscription a kind of naive um, uh, way that leaves you unable, leaves you with no mechanism for defending orthodoxy? Yes, I think that's the case. So um, that's where I think the English General Baptists end up. I don't think in 1719 the majority of them have embraced heterodoxy, but I do think as the century goes on and the decades go on, and it's not many decades after this, that you do have the rise of heterodoxy among the General Baptists, and they just don't have a strong mechanism for defending orthodoxy. Uh, when you see the rise of Dan Taylor uh, later in the century, towards the end of the century, uh, it is with a more kind of strong confessional uh, foundation that orthodoxy is uh, regained among the new connection of General Baptists. But yes, I think the the downplaying, the minimizing uh, of of subscription is highly problematic and left them kind of naively unprotected in a vast kind of just rapidly changing theological setting uh, in in the early 18th century. All right. Well, there you have it. Jesse has set the record straight on the Salters Hall controversy. It, and, and I seriously, in all seriousness, I know how we joked at the beginning of this episode, but this is good work that Jesse has done. And I encourage everyone to check out in different places where Jesse has talked about and examined the Salters Hall issue. And that it's an example for us to be very careful and how easy it is for us to kind of paint with broad strokes, groups in history, events in history. And we don't, we don't like it. I'll put it this way. We don't like it to be done to, on our, to our side. We should not seek to do it to others as well. We should try to be as fair and honest as we can. And we will talk at some point. It is an interesting story about Benjamin Stinton and the whole particular Baptist fund and, and kind of you all, Jesse also talks about this, which I think's really interesting to kind of chew on is that they participated some of these guys in ordination services together, which kind of is, you know, maybe paints a little bit different picture. Sometimes it sounds like the particular and general Baptist were, ch were choking each other if they could, um, that that gives a very much a different spin. Mm. And Benjamin Stinton is in some ways we would say particular Baptist royalty. I mean, he is, you know, can to Benjamin Keach. I'm right on that. It, you know, Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think so. That's I haven't thought about that in a while. I feel this so, is this should be your area to know. Yeah, I think that I think that's right. Yeah, I think well, that's right. Well, I thought so, but then I started having a moment of doubt. Hey, I, w we have to get a guilt connection in. I think you know I mentioned Edward Wallen earlier, who's a subscriber at Salters Hall. Um, his funeral sermon is preached by none other than John Gill. So there you Great. go. And Gill Gill would have just been about to get to London right after these events. Yeah, it's literally within, I think, a year or two uh, yeah. that that Gill comes. And so uh, he's right on the heels of, of this. Um, absolutely. There, there are some yeah. other fascinating Benjamin stories. Stinton, Benjamin Stinton was his son-in-law. Yes. Okay. There, there's another fascinating connection with Benjamin, uh, or, I'm sorry, with John Gill 
uh, and some of the one of the particular Baptist non-subscribers at Salters Hall, uh, one of the particular Baptist non-subscribers uh, was actually on the board of the particular Baptist fund just four or five years later with John Gill. So if non-subscription equals anti-Trinitarian, it's hard to imagine that same guy on a on the particular Baptist fund uh, board with uh, with John Gill. So who knows? <laughs> he, so he didn't have he, he didn't have any time for anti-trinitarians. Yeah, I get I get zero royalties, so I don't feel bad saying this. I would encourage you to pick up a copy of this book from Regents Park uh, College, and uh, they have a lot of great uh, other volumes. Uh, Sam Renahan, which some of you will know, has some good stuff with Regents Park. Hey, folks, look look, I've got a, I've got several of them. Let me move my. You can see you can see right 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 up there. There's a yeah. whole here here's whole, mine. You know what? But Jesse's not telling y'all, and we're going to close with this: that the cover here, this this picture here on the cover, is entitled "The Heretical Synod at Salters Hall." Yeah. So. But what's interesting is the Heretical Synod at Salters Hall was actually written. The work was written by an Anglican by the name of uh, Thomas Lewis, and Thomas Lewis doesn't like any of the dissenters at all, especially the Presbyterians. Uh, so you'll, uh, we'll have to talk about that a little bit more. One quick question real quick. I know our audience can't see all of this, but this picture is fascinating. If you're looking at it, the bottom, the bottom left, is that like a guy with two faces down there? Yeah. I, I was wondering about that. Is it, is he supposed to be two faced? I've, I've looked at this quite a bit. Um, this is worth spending some time on. So you can see um, the upstairs um, you have someone holding like a banner and it says, mm -hmm. all ye that are for the Trinity come upstairs. Come up. We, yeah, we come have up. subscribed. We have subscribed. Um, so th this is a very interesting picture uh, to, to look at, but it comes from Thomas's Lew Thomas Lewis's work uh, on Salter's Hall. I think I know who the two face guy is. <laughs> Matthew Caffin. Well, it, it might, it might actually be there. There is a guy at Salters Hall. No joke. There's a guy who, who signs with the subscribers and with the non-subscribers. Boy. <laughs> so, so maybe this is him. Maybe this is him with the two faces. He, he, he was the moderate squish of his day. So. He just wanted to have his bases covered, you know? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so, well, we hope everybody has enjoyed this excursion in our Baptist Bio series on the Salters Hall controversy. And as we always tell you, stay Baptist, our friends. Stay Baptist.